welcome everyone to another Tafu Talk. If this is your first time joining us, Tafu is short for Teens and Friends United Nature Conservation Organisation and our goal is to join the common objectives of young people and to promote personal responsibility towards nature. Our guest today is Mr Dan Jarvis, the Director of Welfare and Conservation Area Coordinator for Cornwall and Stilly at British Divers Marine Life Rescue. He has been very kind in accepting to talk with us today about BDMLR, their rescues, the threats to British marine life, what is being done to help, and most importantly, what we can all do to help. Welcome, Dan, and very, very lucky f that you're able to join us today. I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, Nika, and thank you, everyone, for joining in with, with this talk and hearing about our work. I will just share my screen so we can see some slides. Hopefully, you can now see Nika. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Uh, so yes, thank you. Um, my name's Dan, I work for British Divers Marine Life Rescue, and I'm here to tell you more about who we are as a charity and what we do with uh, responding to call outs about marine mammals in this country. But to start with, we'll go back to the beginning and how we began, which was back in 1988. Back then there was an outbreak of a disease called focine distemper virus, which is similar to canine distemper virus that dogs can suffer from. And this had never actually happened before. There hadn't been an outbreak of this disease in Europe. So it began over in the Baltic and gradually spread along the coast of Northern Europe through Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands and so on until it reached here in the UK. Now it mainly affected common seals, which is one of the two seal species native to the UK. Uh, and we were finding a lot of animals washing up along the east coast of the country that were in a really poor state of health and needed help. Now there was very little infrastructure for mass rescue and rehabilitation of marine mammals back then. Uh, nothing like this had happened before, so there was nothing set up for it, of course. Um, the only thing that really was in existence was a small, wildlife hospital run by the RSPCA in Norfolk. So as this uh, epidemic spread and continued and had its effects on the seals, the, uh, this, this group of divers came together to help the RSPCA with picking up the uh, ill seals off of the beaches, getting them to their centre or to vets where they would be able to treat them as need be. So that's how we began. Over the next few years, this group of divers started getting more involved in other marine mammal related conservation projects. And here's another of them called Into the Blue. This was a project in conjunction with the Born Free Foundation to repatriate three captive bottlenose dolphins from the last dolphin area in the UK that closed down and to return them to the wild where they had originally come from in the Caribbean. So the photos you can see here are the animals being loaded onto a plane in specially made uh, containers where they could be looked after by a specialised team of veterinarians and animal carers. And they were returned back to the Caribbean and placed into a sea pen where they had to learn how to be wild dolphins again, having been in captivity, hand fed from a bucket of fish constantly for years and years. Uh, they'd lost that natural sort of instinct and ability to hunt, forage and just generally look after themselves in a wild setting. So uh, they had to basically be trained how to be wild dolphins again. And this took place over a period of months and once the animals were deemed to be fit enough to be released, which thankfully they were at the end, uh, which is the worry that they, they, they might not have been. They were then released back out into the sea, which was fantastic and they did survive. In the same year, there was also a major oil spill uh, up in Shetland from a oil container ship called the Breyer, uh, which ran aground during stormy weather. And there were huge amounts of wildlife casualties associated with this, mainly seabirds, but also some seals. And again, in such a remote area of the UK, there was very little infrastructure for mass animal rescue and care. So once again, our diver uh, diving team, uh, they travelled all the way up there with one of their boats to try to reach some of the more difficult locations to get in and retrieve casualties and get them taken to the wildlife hospital there 
for care and in conjunction with the SSPCA. Uh, in the aftermath, they actually also used their boat to take um, uh, salvage crews out and uh, insurance surveyors to go and look at the wreck as well. Pretty much the same thing happened again in South Wales in 1996. Unfortunately, another oil tanker, this time called the Sea Empress, ran aground and sprang a leak, polluting the local environment. And again, it's quite a wildlife rich area. So a lot of seabirds and again, a handful of seals were uh, affected by this. Once again, our team went out to uh, retrieve casualties by boat from difficult to reach areas and again get them into rehabilitation, this time with the RSPCA, of course. And then in 2002, uh, which is after we introduced our marine mammal medic courses, which I'll mention later on, uh, we had another outbreak of PDV. Uh, it followed the same pattern as the outbreak in 1988 and reached the UK. Uh, once again, where we again, again had many, many casualties, thousands of animals affected, uh, and most of which died off, unfortunately, from secondary infections, including septicemia and pneumonia. Uh, a quarter of the animals that were rescued and taken for rehabilitation did survive to be released out to the wild. Uh, so it really gives you a good idea of the scale of the impact this disease had on common seal uh, populations on the east coast of England and across Europe as well, of course, not just here. But we were better prepared for it this time because it had happened previously. There was more infrastructure and planning in place. Uh, we have the volunteer network that had since been set up to respond to uh, animals in distress. So we had a lot more going on this time in our ability to respond to this outbreak. Moving on to 2006, uh, this is probably the incident we're most famous for. Uh, this was the stranding of a northern bottlenose whale in central London in January of 2006. Uh, it's not a species we'd ever really dealt with before. Um, and it's actually a deep diving specialist. It normally lives well offshore. They don't come to the coast at all. They're usually diving at 2,000 metres and specifically feed on squid mainly. So being in the North Sea for an extended period of time, and of course coming up the River Thames, this animal had not been feeding for quite a considerable period of time. Uh, and as we later found out, was in quite poor nutritional condition. So um, as this was a new species, a new stranding type of stranding for us to deal with, we as volunteers carried out the usual first aid measures that we would. We had one of the specialist marine mammal vets from the UK who's actually based at London Zoo, who came out to examine the animal. And of course, being in central London, it attracted a huge amount of attention from the public and also the media who were broadcasting it live around the world throughout the day to an audience at its peak of over 600 million people. So it was an enormous amount of pressure for our team to be under the spotlight like this uh, with a huge audience of people people watching and of course commenting on what was going on uh, as well and we were working in conjunction with the emergency services and the Port of London Authority as there needed to be of course a lot of security and crowd control uh, the, the, the riverbanks and bridges in particular were completely jammed with traffic and people who had stopped to watch what was going on so as part of our response we actually loaded the animal in our specialist whale rescue pontoons. We actually winched it out of the water onto a barge and onto an upturned rib for comfort and took it downstream and out of the, the sort of the trouble area uh, that it was creating with, uh, with uh, the crowds of people. And it was on the barge that the specialist vet was able to carry out his assessment, determined it to be in a poor nutritional state with a poor prognosis. And of course, the whole reason it had ended up in that condition was it was, you know, a huge distance from its normal habitat um, and releasing it back into the North Sea, back into the water out there was not going to solve that problem and it would eventually uh, die of starvation uh, and exhaustion. Uh, so at that point that the animal was deemed to be unsuitable for release and they were going to put it to sleep, it actually did die of its own accord. Uh, but of course, that was uh, seemingly always going to be the outcome for this particular animal. And it's strandings like this with, uh, you know, some of these specialist species where we really do learn lots. Uh, and we incorporate that then into our protocols in strandings response going forward into the future. 
that's the last couple of photos of that incident there. So um, what do we do actually now as a charity? Well, we do still get involved in projects like this, but the main thing that we do is provide a frontline marine mammal response service for animals in distress around the coast of the UK. Back in the late 90s, we set up what was um, termed a marine mammal medic training course. And this is for volunteers who uh, can come from any background. They don't have to be a diver or a marine biologist or anything like that. It's for anyone, as long as they're over 18, to get involved with. And I'll talk a little bit more about the training later on. And this is what we use to respond to call outs around the country now. And as you can see, from this chart here in the last few years, we do get an awful lot of calls. Now, this does cover everything. So it does absolutely mean these are, some of these are animals that have been rescued, but equally it can be animals that we got called about, but actually had nothing wrong with them. Uh, so we can either leave them in situ uh, if we've checked on them. Uh, sometimes it might be the animals aren't in a good place. So with seal pups, especially, this is really what I'm talking about. If they come up in busy harbors or busy beaches where they're really in the way and gonna be really at risk of um, disturbance, dog attacks, those sorts of things, we can relocate them somewhere else. Uh, that's much safer for them and they can sleep and rest for as long as they want undisturbed then. So, as I say, we're getting busier over the years, and I'll get on to the reasons why in just a moment. I'm just going to break this down on a monthly basis. Uh, and the main thing to note, of course, is where the peaks in our call outs happen. So in summer, and that's the uh, common seal pupping season. So it's usually as young pups in the first few days or weeks of their life. And then we have the other seal species, the grey seal you might remember I mentioned earlier. Uh, and they give birth through the autumn and winter. So that's where we get the bigger peak as they've got a higher population in this country than uh, common seals. So that's why we get busier with them. Now, why are we getting busier? Well, the first thing to mention is that over the last couple of years with the COVID pandemic, that doesn't seem to have had an effect on our call out numbers at all. If anything, um, it has actually increased them in some areas as people have been left with little else to do at lot. Uh, uh, during lockdowns then folks on the beach if they live close enough to it. Uh, but the main things that we would categorise as causing the increases in call outs. Oh, sorry, did you say something, Nika? Oh yeah, just sorry, just broke up for a second. Could you maybe just repeat the last sentence or two? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll start from the COVID bit again. So the main thing to consider, uh, first of all, is our own pandemic with COVID. Um, that doesn't seem to have had any effect at all on the volume of call outs that we're receiving. If anything, in, actually, in actual fact, in some areas, it seems to have increased it as during lockdowns, especially people have largely had nothing else to do but go for walks or go for walks on beaches and then uh, finding things more often. Uh, but we can broadly categorise uh, the increasing call outs into four categories. Um, the first of which is the increasing awareness of BDMR because there's more of our volunteers around, we're getting more calls about things, we're just generally having more contact with people on the beaches. But it's also easier to find us through social media, uh, smartphones, you know, advances in technology, a lot more people have access to information in the palm of their hands. So it's easier to find a hotline number and to call someone for help when they find something that they're worried about. But also the media have taken more interest in recent years in environmental issues, so particularly things like climate change and plastic pollution. Uh, and it does seem that this has helped highlight uh, what people can do to help animals, including calling for help when they find animals of concern that might need assistance from vets or rehabilitation centres and so on. The increasing human population is also a factor. There's more people who live at the coast and use it. There's also a lot more people visiting the coast and will use it. And there's also been this increase in lots of different activities at the coast, like stand up paddleboarding, kayaking, uh, wild swimming and coast steering, which means people are having a lot more contact with nature. And with a lot more people being out there, of course, naturally, it's more likely that they're going to find animals that they're concerned about and then report on to us. The other thing that we're seeing, uh, which is more of a concern, is that as people do have more contact with wildlife, we're also seeing the negative interactions for the animals as well. So there's a lot more disturbance of uh, marine wildlife. So seals that hold out on beaches, 
uh, seabirds on cliffs, uh, dolphins been chased by boats, that sort of thing. Uh, you, you know, they're really sensitive to these sorts of things. And when it comes to seals being disturbed, it could result in mums and pups being separated, uh, injuries to the animals as they stampede off the beach in their attempt to escape into the sea where they feel safe. Uh, so this is one of the big challenges is that um, this problem is really increasing now and we're trying to get messaging out there through a coalition called the Seal Alliance uh, to promote best practice in seal watching and to make sure people leave the animals alone. There's no need for people to get up close to them. Uh, you know, if they want to get close, they'll do it on their terms. We don't need to go in uh, to their space and practically scare them off. Uh, for the sake of being close to them. So that's been a really important development in the last few years. The other one is climate change. And having been doing this myself for 20 years now, I have seen how much it has changed, particularly in the last nine years or so. Uh, we're getting more storms, severe storms, coming in off the Atlantic, particularly in the autumn and winter, which is affecting the grey seals during their pupping uh, time through that uh, through those months so we're getting a lot more casualties as a result of these storms and in the most extreme cases uh, these storms are wiping out over 70 percent of the pups overnight uh, so storm brian uh, in southwest england and wales in 2017 storm arwen in southeast scotland and northeast england in 2021 uh, have had these really extreme effects which might be the first evidence of an emerging population level threat for grey seals, which is really quite scary. Uh, the final thing to mention is that in the last four or five years, we've had an issue with poor health in the common seal population in East England. Uh, we've been seeing a condition that we're terming mouth rot, uh, which is as nasty as it sounds. Uh, and the animals, unfortunately, are just so debilitated from this, they aren't surviving. And we have an investigation going on at the moment with uh, vets and the uh, university to try and gather samples and figure out what is causing this, how it's spreading, because it really is quite a nasty uh, disease, whatever it is. So moving on, um, I'd introduce you now to our two native seal species here in the UK. I've mentioned them already a little bit, but uh, the top one there is the common seal. It's got a slightly more rounded face with a shorter muzzle, uh, slightly more cat-like appearance, and they're the smaller of the two species, getting to around 1.8 metres long. And then below we have the grey seal, uh, which is uh, a slightly longer muzzle. Uh, males in particular have what we call a Roman nose developed. They have this really big arched uh, muzzle and they the males in particular are uh, quite large when they're fully grown at over two and a half meters long so they're pretty big when they are fully grown now uh, there's a little it's a little bit confusing when you come to the populations of them I briefly mentioned it earlier gray seals actually have a bigger population in the UK than common seals but common seals worldwide have a much larger population than grey seals. In fact, grey seals are one of the rarer seal species in the world. It's just that here in the UK, we are lucky enough to have about 36% of the world population. So that makes it sound like we've got loads and loads of them. But in actual fact, that's not quite true either. There are only around 350,000 grey seals in the world, found only in the North Atlantic. So us being home to around about a third of the world population makes us a stronghold for their population. Uh, so we only have uh, sort of around 120,000 living around the UK. That's still less than the population of red squirrels. So that really puts it into perspective, you know, how rare and how special this species is and why they deserve uh, protection. Uh, looking at our call outs, uh, and I did mention this earlier on in the monthly chart that we saw, this just breaks down really the, just the seal call outs that we had in 2020. So you can see that peak in the summer in red for the common seals, and then most of the rest of the year is taken up by the grey seals. And as I mentioned again earlier, it's usually the pups in the first few days and weeks of their life that are getting into difficulty and need our help. So what are those reasons? Well, sometimes it's very young pups that are separated from their mum and they can't survive on their own. Even though they only stay with mum for three weeks, uh, it's a really tough time for them. And around about 70% of pups don't see their first birthday. The first year is really, really hard on them. 
We see many animals, particularly after stormy weather, that are debilitated, exhausted, malnourished uh, as well, struggling to survive. And we also see various kinds of infections as well, so respiratory diseases, eye problems, infected wounds, and so on and so forth. Uh, entanglement is a big problem with marine litter. Uh, all sorts of injuries as well, whether it be storm-related damage, bite wounds from other seals, but sadly, increasingly, dog attacks as well. And we do occasionally deal with adults, uh, usually animals that are more end of life than anything, whether that be from natural causes or otherwise, but it's um, not something that we deal with very often. It usually is, as I say, the pups that we are getting calls about. When we are sending our volunteers out to respond to these animals, uh, we have a process, of course, that these volunteers will have gone through in their training course that are then followed on the beach. For especially young pups that could still potentially be with their mum, we'll actually hang back for up to 24 hours and monitor it and keep other people well back because if the mum is still around she won't come back if there's lots of people close by to it and we don't want to interfere with the pup and get a foreign scent on it as the mum will only recognise her pup through smell. So it's really important for us to determine that first, but if for any other reason the animal does have uh, serious health issues or is an older pup that's independent, then we can get hands on if we feel that it, there's uh, a need to and carry out an in-depth inspection of the animal's health. So we have our trusty towel, which we'll use to wrap around its head and keep its jaw closed. They do have a good set of teeth and they will defend themselves with them when they feel threatened, which of course, when you have someone coming at you with a towel, uh, of course you would. Um, when we've got the animal safely under control, we can carry out a, an efficient um, examination of the animal's health, look for any wounds, signs and symptoms of infection and so on. If it's really dehydrated, as you can see in the lower centre photo, we can provide rehydration fluids via a stomach tube. And from all of the information that we gather on this assessment, we can then come to a decision what would be best uh, for the animal's welfare. So if, of course, it's uh, a seriously ill or injured animal, or seriously underweight, we can take it for rehabilitation at one of the many centres that we work with around the country. Um, if it's otherwise okay, we can either leave it be on the beach or we can relocate it somewhere safer if where it is isn't a good place for it to stay on. And that's generally what we'll be doing in those circumstances. So that's what we do with seals. With cetaceans, there are around 90 species currently recognised around the world, uh, 31 of which have been recorded around the UK. Of course, we're not going to go through all of them right now. I've just selected here the five most frequently seen species around the country. Starting in the top left, we have the harbour porpoise, which is the smallest at around 1.8 metres long, very similar to a common seal, in fact. Uh, they're abundant and distributed all around the UK. You can pretty much see them wherever you are around the coast. They do live quite close inshore as well, but because they are so small and also quite shy, they're very difficult to spot. They don't show well at the surface. They're not prone to jumping out and showing off like some of the biggest pieces of cetacean are. Uh, they tend to keep to themselves, usually in relatively small groups. Uh, they have that little triangular dorsal fin that you can see there. Uh, but as I say, they're quite shy. If you do see them, you're actually a little bit lucky, uh, really. Next to them, though, we have got the proper show offs. These are the bottlenose nosed dolphins that people are probably a lot more familiar with. And they can grow to around four meters and weigh well over half a ton. They are huge, powerful animals. And there are three recognized resident populations in the UK, one in Scotland in the Moray Firth, one in Cardigan Bay in West Wales, and another more recently identified in the uh, English Channel along the south coast of England. Uh, so there are other populations of them, usually ones that live further offshore that are seldom seen, and they tend to be populations of larger animals. The resident populations are uh, smaller populations that stick usually uh, within a refined, uh, a, a, a restricted sort of home area, but are also known to go quite long distances and visit other places too. In the middle row, we have the common dolphin, which grows to around two and a half metres. So it's one of the smaller uh, of the dolphin species. And it's really distinctive because of that yellow flash you can see on its flanks. 
uh, they can be seen in groups well into the hundreds. Uh, they are quite precarious and usually quite fast moving as well. Uh, they tend to be found more towards the south and west of the UK. Uh, very rare for them to be around in the North Sea. On the other hand, we have got the white beaked dolphin, which is a little bit more of a colder water species and more frequently seen around Scotland in the, and, and in the North Sea as well. Uh, not so much towards the south of the UK. Uh, you can see where they get their name from. Uh, no prizes for guessing where that comes from, uh, but they grow to around 3.1 meters long. So a little bit bigger than the common dolphin, not quite so big as the bottlenose. Down at the bottom there, we've got the minke whale. Uh, this is the only representative of the baleen whale species. So they don't actually have teeth. They have plates of keratin, which hang down from the upper jaw and they filter feed on plankton and small fish. Minke whales are the smallest of these species, getting to around about nine meters long. And you can see them around much of the UK, uh, the Northern North Sea, uh, around the West Coast, maybe not so much towards the Southeast of England, very rarely will they show up there, but not impossible. They are also especially distinctive because of the white band they have around their pectoral fin. And this is a key way to identify this species because none of the other baleen whale species have that. Looking at call outs for cetaceans that we received in 2020, uh, as you can see, it's a, well, a bit of a mess, quite frankly. Um, they are a lot less consistent than seals in where and when they turn up. Uh, the two key ones are harbour porpoises and common dolphins, though, as the two most abundant species around the UK. They're the ones we're getting calls about most frequently. And you can see that they are represented in most months of the year. But as for the others, it is a lot lot more of a uh, sort of a checkered uh, checkerboard of uh, where, when and how often they turn up. What do we do when we have stranded cetaceans? Well, the reasons that they might strand include very malnourished animals, uh, those that are outside of their normal habitat, like the northern bottlenose whale that I mentioned earlier. Uh, animals sometimes do simply get caught out by the tide. Uh, animals like common dolphins usually live offshore. If they come up into estuaries in, in, and into tidal areas or harbors, they actually can get a little bit confused and uh, get stuck that way. Uh, various kinds of infections and injuries, once again, similar to seals, uh, and also maternally separated calves as well. When these animals on the beach, our volunteer medics are trained in how to provide first aid and to carry out health assessments. But in this case, we will always involve a veterinarian in the assessment because it's really important that we're making the correct decision in the best interests of the animal's welfare. And that's because we don't have rehabilitation as an option in the UK for various kinds of reasons. Now, the options that are available to us are if the animal is deemed to be healthy enough, that we can release it back into the sea again using a set protocol of doing this uh, 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 sensibly. Uh, the other option, of course, is to relieve the animal of suffering. And that's what the vet is also there for if the animal does need to be put to sleep for that reason as well. Uh, and as I say, it's really important we do what's in the best interests of the animal's welfare for as much as we would love in our hearts to put every animal we come across back into the sea. It just isn't possible in every single case. As I mentioned on the previous slide, there can be some really good reasons why these animals turn up in a really poor state of health and putting them back into the sea uh, doesn't actually solve their health problem. It will prolong their suffering, in fact, and that's what we want to avoid. So any further distress, pain that the animal's going through, you know, it's come ashore because it can't cope with being in the sea anymore pretty much. So we need to make those decisions very, very carefully. So training, how do you get involved in this? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you do not have to be a diver. You don't have to be a marine, bio marine biologist. You can come from any background and get involved in this. So long as you are in, uh, aged over 18. We have lectures, uh, which are actually now online, unlike this photo uh, from the olden days before COVID. Uh, we have online lectures that will teach you all about species identification and biology of marine mammals. Uh, we then have a whole day on, uh, sorry, we then have a whole lecture on uh, seal 
uh, assessment, health assessment, first aid, uh, the decision making, and then the same again for cetaceans. The training day itself is spent all on the beach and we have a life-size seal pup. We'll teach you how to catch with a towel and do that health assessment. We have a whale and dolphin, pilot whale and dolphin, both life-size with the whale filled with water. So it will be a lifelike weight as well. It's really heavy. And we'll show you how to use our specialist whale rescue pontoons to refloat it. And with the dolphin, um, we can go through in much more detail the first aid with cetaceans and show the safe uh, lifting and carrying process for a dolphin in the tarpaulin. So we can actually take it to speak. as, of course, a whale, way too heavy to lift and carry. We have to wait for the tide to come up and do the work for us. So that's preparing you for the real thing. You then go onto our call out list. So whenever something happens in your area, we'll send a mass message out to everybody. And it is as a volunteer, if you are available at that moment in time, you can call in, get the details and respond on our behalf. And you can go out with experienced medics. We'll be on the phones as well to look at photos and videos to help with assessments and decision making on the other end of a hotline too. And we'll come to a resolution for that animal. So in the meantime, what else can you do to help? Well, if you do come across an animal you're worried about, then you can call our hotline on the number you can see displayed here. If it's a seal, just be aware they can bite uh, and they can carry diseases that they can pass to us too. So uh, best to stay at a distance, don't disturb them and scare them off into the sea because if they're gone in the water, we can't do much else for them. We always deal with them on the land. Uh, keep other people well back as well with yourself and dogs under control on a lead. That's really, really important too. As I mentioned earlier, we've seen increased dog attacks around the whole country with uh, seal pups alone on the beach. With cetaceans, if you have one that's live stranded, uh, we can provide a lot of the advice over the phone uh, and we can get, of course, our volunteers out sooner as uh, uh, from the moment we receive the call. So the earlier we get the phone call, the more we can do for that animal together. But again, just be aware of the disease risk. They can hurt you with their tail. If they're thrashing about, it can really give you quite a good whack. Um, don't just throw it back in the sea either. As I mentioned earlier, there's some really good reasons why these animals strand. And if they're really unwell and unfit, they will probably just wash back up straight away and it'll be causing them a lot more uh, distress, potentially causing further injuries to them as they get rolled back up onto the shore as well. Uh, and as I say, we can provide advice over the phone, such as keeping it upright and just keeping it wet, avoiding getting any water in the blowhole um, and other advice in the meantime until we can get help there from our team. We don't do this alone, of course. There are a huge number of organisations that we work in collaboration with, from the emergency services to the statutory bodies and other con conservation organisations, and of course, the seal rehabilitation centres around the country. And that just leaves me to say a big thank you for you all listening. I hope that's been a really interesting uh, talk for you about our work and the uh, uh, network that we have. And if you are getting involved, you can go onto our website and find out more about training courses or other things that we're involved with. And of course, we're on social media as well. So please do fo uh, follow our pages to keep up with news and other updates of things that are happening with us at BDMLR. Anyway, that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening and coming along, along to find out more about BDMLR and Marine Mammal Rescue here in the UK. And Mika, it's back over to you. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, I just have a few questions, if that's OK. Yes, go ahead. Um, you said that seals are most most often uh, are the most most common injured animals and most often call outs for is in cetaceans is which one is the most common in cetaceans you said uh common 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 dolphins and what were the other ones uh yeah of course um common dolphins and harbour porpoises are the two most abundant species around the uk so they tend to be the ones that we get calls about most often um after that it really is quite variable. Um, each year seems to be somewhat different to another. So for instance, um, this year we haven't had any call outs about fin whales, whereas a couple of years ago we had three, uh, all of which were live stranded uh, that we were involved with. Um, so it, yeah, it, ca it can be really variable year on year what 
happens with the other species. Okay. Is there a general month where there's more overall or not? I mean, you said for the seals, but for cetaceans? Yeah, there's uh, there's less pattern with the cetaceans. Um, with harbour porpoises, there's possibly a little bit of an increase around spring, which is when they are giving birth to their calves, and maybe they're having more issues or calves are getting separated from mums. Um, common dolphins potentially a little bit in winter. We seem to be getting a lot of common dolphins around the southwest uh, of the country at that time of the year, so that there might be a little bit of an uptick then. Um, but again, with the other species, it's because they're so scarce with the strandings numbers in the data that it's, it's hard to really draw conclusions for them. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, is, is there a species that's easiest to save? Uh, yeah, um, uh, common dolphins, again, coming back to them, they are be, being one of the most frequently stranded, but also as an offshore species that is sometimes more likely to strand because they're just in the wrong place at the wrong time, like up an estuary and they get caught out. If they're in otherwise good health and they get found in time and we can provide good health care to them, they stand a really good chance of being refloated. Um, with harbour porpoises, it's actually a little bit different because they are a coastal species. They're a lot less likely to strand by accident. Um, they're actually more likely to strand through disease or injury, uh, end of life, that sort of thing. Um, so it, when we're dealing with them, it's actually more likely that they're not going to survive than it is with common dolphins, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, are, are, is, is there... One second. Is there... Traffic, sorry. Um, is uh, most of your missions a success or is there a success rate that you have? Yeah, it's um, it's variable with uh, the species. So sticking with cetaceans for the moment, um, we have to look at success in the right outcome for the animals. So in those terms, refloating an animal as well as euthanasia are both the correct decisions for the animal's welfare. So they can both be termed successes. Um, but if we're looking just at refloating animals back into the water, uh, you, you, you know, there's only so many animals that we get per year that come in that are like, able to be refloated. Um, but if you take that in combination with euthanasia, then our success rate is somewhere around sort of 60 to 70 percent, uh, which is really good. The other animals, of course, the ones that have died either before we've got there or during the assessment before, uh, you know, we've been able to put them to sleep or even before they've refloated as sometimes they find the whole experience of being stranded incredibly stressful or if they've been out of the water for too long, they can actually crush themselves to death under their own weight as they've never evolved to support their own body weight, of course. Uh, so that's kind of what we're up against in some of these cases. It is quite time limited. Um, and if the animal is simply there too long, doesn't stand much of a chance at all, unfortunately. When we come to seals, uh, again, there's some variation between the two species, but uh, gray seals are really tough little cookies. They can soldier on through seemingly the worst of injuries and illnesses and make it through the rehabilitation process and release back out to the wild. Success rates at most rehab centers is over 90%, which is incredibly good. With common seals, they do seem to be a bit more susceptible to disease. For whatever reason, they just don't seem to have quite as good of an immune system as grey seals. So the success rate for common seals is, is more like 50%, maybe between 40-50% getting back out into the wild from rehab. So they can be quite tricky. You said that cetaceans can't stay out of water for very long. What is there a time period that they can stay out or does it vary for each animal? That's absolutely right. Yeah, that generally speaking, the larger the animal, the less time it can spend out of the water before that effect of crushing itself under its own body weight will have fatal effects on the animal. Uh, this is as toxins build up, blood circulation is reduced or cut off to parts of the body or organs. Uh, you know, so, so that, you know, the toxic shock basically as it builds up will kill off the animal. Um, with, uh, again, if we go to common dolphins with a healthy animal with good first aid and care, it could potentially last 12 hours out of the water and can still be viable to refloat. With something like massive, like a sperm whale, uh, you, you know, you could be looking at as soon as two hours before that 
animal is, is fatally affected by that effect of crushing. Oh, wow, that's really sad. So how quickly do your volunteers often have to get to the site? So as volunteers, um, whenever we have a call out come in, we don't know who the nearest volunteer is going to be in until we put the message out and people start calling in. So it could be a really convenient one that might be 10 minutes away from the nearest volunteer who is available. So we can have quite quick response times. But when you get to some really remote areas of the country, like uh, the northwest of Scotland, for example, we actually have very few volunteers up there. And sometimes it could be an hour before we're able to get the nearest volunteer who's available onto the site itself. So sometimes we are having to advise members of the public over the phone. Uh, this is especially true on some of the islands as well around Scotland where we actually don't have any volunteers at all and there's no SSPCA officer and so on. And sometimes in those circumstances, we're having to talk people through uh, 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 give, giving the animal first aid and getting us photos that can be assessed by vets and so on and so forth. So if, there's an, if you don't have any volunteers on the island, do you send someone at the end or not? Well. We have done in the past, yeah. So we had a mass stranding with pilot whales on a Scottish island uh, a couple of years ago um, and we were able to talk through uh, the local community who were on the beach with them, how to refloat them. Uh, and in the meantime, we were getting a couple of our own volunteers uh, prepared to come across on a ferry with rescue equipment. Um, and that they actually came over the next day as the animals were still in the area. And actually, by the time they got to the island, some of the animals had restranded. So they then went, uh, were then able to sort of take charge of the uh, situation and guide the animals back out again. What do you do if the animal dies in the process? Like, do you perform a post-mortem or something? We work really closely with a couple of organisations funded by the government. Uh, for England and Wales, that's the Cetacean Strandings Investigation Programme based in London. And in Scotland, it's the Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Scheme, who are based at Glasgow. And when we have an animal that has stranded, that has uh, either died or that we have put to sleep, and uh, uh, and, and need to move on to them, uh, they can carry out the post-mortem examination to look at, you know, potential causes for the stranding. They can take lots of samples from the animal that can be used for all sorts of interesting research, such as um, uh, finding out pollution burdens in their different body parts and their blubber. Uh, they can, you, you know, look if, if that animal has been pregnant in the past and how many times. They can uh, uh, look at d d disease, types of injuries, so on and so forth as well. So uh, you get a lot of information and a lot of really good feedback from the post-mortem examinations. And in, as I mentioned earlier on with the Northern Bottlenose Whale in London, he, some of this is valuable enough for us to change and alter our protocols. So they're always gradually evolving as we go into the future, as we learn new information from our own strandings, but also from strandings in other countries and other organizations that we um, uh, talk to and work with as well. So there's a weird noise outside. I'm not sure what it is. It might be siren. We often have sirens here. Um, that sounds really interesting. So do, you, like, what's the most co cause of these strandings? Like, would it be climate change or maybe plastic pollution or what would it be? Uh, it's variable between species what the key causes of uh, strandings or, or um, animals needing help are. Um, and it also changes geographically as well. So it's it's a, it's a quite a complex, but also sometimes interlinked pattern. So harbour porpoises generally were seeing them strand due to ill health, disease, that kind of thing. Uh, we see, you know, common dolphins I mentioned earlier, we sometimes see stranding more often by accident and are otherwise in good health, uh, but sometimes they are injured or in poor health as well. Um, if it's something like northern bottlenose whales or sperm whales, which are the deep diving specialists, pretty much all of them coming up on the coast are already well outside their normal habitat, far offshore in extremely deep waters where they dive thousands of meters in search of food, specialists like squid. Um, 
So uh, if they're yeah, if they're washing up on the coast, you can almost guarantee in most cases they are already going to be in a really poor state of health simply because they're so far outside their normal habitat. So the North Sea in particular is well known as a bit of a whale trap for these deep diving species. But it could be that climate change is pushing these animals out of their normal areas that they would be foraging in as well because prey is shifting, uh, you know, plankton is forming at different times of the year um, and in different areas from traditional feeding grounds. So these animals are being pushed further to find adequate food sources as well. So this might be part of the reason. Um, and when we're looking at uh, things like plastic pollution, then uh, that is also quite interesting because we, we do get large whales entangled in marine pollution sometimes. We have our own specialised large whale disentanglement team who are trained with specialist equipment to go out and deal with those animals on the water. Um, and what we also know from post-mortem examinations is that around the UK, we actually have uh, very few actually, uh, less than five cases of whales that have died as a direct result of plastic ingestion. However, if you go to somewhere like the Mediterranean, they have a much higher incidence of it down there. And part of the reason for that, we believe, is because the Mediterranean being quite an enclosed area, a lot of the pollution isn't dispersing as much as it is, say, around the UK, where you have the whole Atlantic Ocean around us for pollution to disperse in. So it's more likely animals in the Mediterranean have these burdens of plastic pollution that they're ingesting because there's a higher density of the pollution there for them. Um, when we look at, at seals, um, again, we don't really have much issue in the way of plastic ingestion, but we certainly do in the way of entanglement in marine litter. Uh, the problem is really, really bad with uh, grey seals in particular and studies that we've been involved with show potentially up to 5% of the population either is or has been entangled in marine litter at some point in their life. And that's one of the highest rates of entanglement for any seal or sea lion species in the world. Oh, wow. is, is there a reason why they're so prone to it? Um, partly because they have the higher population around the UK compared with common seals and also uh, just natural seal curiosity. You know, they are intelligent animals. They like to play when they're young, especially as juveniles, new items, you know, bits of fishing nets or uh, plastic packaging bands or even frisbees is something we've seen seals getting caught in now and can't get them back off from around their neck. Uh, and it causes, you know, devastating injuries to them. They're, they're essentially being decapitated in slow motion is the effect the entanglement are ha uh, having on them. So you have this limited amount of time in which you're able to get to these animals and free them before they will die either due to the extent of the injury or due to the infections that it allows into them as well. Uh, so as I say it's a really big problem around the UK uh, but also in other places around the world as well. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can do for an animal if it's in the water? It's really difficult with animals in the water, particularly seals, they will just dive and disappear and they'll be gone. Uh, you know, they're so quick, you just can't get up close to them really. Uh, and similar on land as well, if they're right on the water's edge, if they see, smell, hear you coming, the first thing they will do is run to the water for safety where they can get away quickly. Uh, so they can be extremely difficult to catch on land, especially adults, because you need a lot more people and some more uh, heavy duty equipment to safely contain them. Whereas seal pups, of course, two or three people can easily deal with one of those. Uh, when it comes to cetaceans, uh, again, we don't really deal with them in the water very often, but there have been times where we've had uh, animals that we've been observing and monitoring and we have concern that they potentially could be stranding, like pilot whales that might be mass stranding potentially. Um, and we have taken action in the past to actually use boats to gently herd them away from the shore and out of danger and potentially prevented the actual stranding from happening in the first place. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> um, what was my next question? I forgot now. Um, oh yeah, do you respond to all types of injuries? Like if there's a small injury, would you still send someone out or not? Yeah, if we've got a concern about uh, the extent of an injury or if there's the potential for infection, we can still go out and check the animal. That might still just be visually rather than hands-on. Um, and if the animal doesn't need a closer inspection, we can just leave it be and not stress it out with the hands-on uh, uh, check over. 
Um, if we do need to get hands on, of course, we'll have a close look at the injury. That's only if we've got a greater cause of concern that it might affect the animal's health and you know potential for survival. Um, but uh, some injuries they can bounce back from. So um, even animals with entanglement injuries that aren't too deep, uh, we can clean those injuries up if they're otherwise not infected. Seawater is actually really good at keeping injuries like that clean and they will heal up much better that way. Uh, even then being taken into rehabilitation where actually the process for cleaning up injuries like that would be to put them in salt water as soon as you can for as long as you can so with animals that are otherwise okay if the injury is not too bad and not infected we can actually let those go there and then and they stand a really really good chance of surviving those. Yeah well how many volunteer marine medics do you have? Marine mammal medics? <laughs> Around the whole country, we have about 2,000 trained marine mammal medics, uh, but of course, we're always on the lookout for more. Uh, one of our biggest challenges going forward into the future is the increasing call outs we're getting, as you saw on the chart earlier on in the talk. Uh, you know, we've got to keep up with that, and it is a struggle, especially in our hotspot areas, because, uh, you, you know, that we, where, where the seal populations are higher around parts of the country, so uh, say around Norfolk or Yorkshire, uh, Northumberland, uh, Cornwall, places like that. We get really, really busy with lots and lots of call outs in a short space of time. So we need enough volunteers to be able to keep up with that. But that's not to say we don't need volunteers in the quiet areas as well, because in the quiet areas, we do still get call outs every now and again. And we need a team that's trained and ready to respond with equipment to those too. So with everyone being volunteers, you can't always guarantee that the nearest people are going to be available or how many people are going to be available for a stranded dolphin or a poorly seal on a beach somewhere. So it's always good for us to, you know, essentially have more volunteers than we need, really, to ensure that we can keep up our level of response, especially in the face of these increasing call outs. Yeah, that makes sense, I guess. <laughs> um, what do you want to ask? Oh, yeah. Is, is your training course free or if it isn't, how much do you have to pay? Our training course is £115, uh, £115 pounds, uh, to take part in. Uh, so that covers all of your initial training uh, and the training day itself that you go on. Uh, you also get your certification. Uh, you get a Marine Mammal Medic Handbook, which is uh, everything that you learn on the medic course, plus some more background information as well to take away with you. Uh, and an ID card and a few other little bits like uh, BDMR car stickers and so on as well. What that also includes is your first year's uh, subscription, which includes insurance. Uh, that's the really key part for taking part in activities with BDMLR. Uh, so if the individual is injured, they are covered under our insurance policy then. Um, that policy then needs to be updated every year or renewed every year, I should say. So the renewal uh, fee is actually only £30 there on afterwards and any training in the meantime is free. That sounds good. <laughs> and after you do, after one does the training, how was the process to like get it to be a volunteer? So everyone that does our training will then be added to a call out database. So you'll be allocated to the region in which you live. Uh, that might be, for example, uh, North Norfolk, or it could be, um, uh, you know, the Northumberland area or so, uh, or North Wales or so on. Uh, so whenever a call out comes to that area, we from head office on the hotline will put out a mass text message to all of the volunteers in, say, North Norfolk. Um, and it just is a case of whoever is available at that time can call in and get the details from our hotline coordinator and enable them to respond to an incident. Mm -hmm. Are there any restrictions on who can be a volunteer except for age? Uh, no, age is the main thing. Um, obviously, a fair degree of uh, fitness and mobility uh, because you're working sometimes on uh, rocky ground or difficult to access places, beaches, um, across rocks and so on and so forth. So those are the only things to really bear in mind. Mm -hmm. If you get a call out on a beach surrounded by cliffs, how, how do you go about getting to it? Would you use a boat? Yeah, we use boats in some cases to get to difficult to access animals um, and uh, in uh, very rare circumstances we actually have 
a specialised team of abseilers who go down cliffs to get seals as well, but that's just at one particular location where we do frequently get call outs, but it's actually not possible to get in by boat there. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, the very large majority of seals we're getting are on regular public beaches that lots of people use, so uh, there's usually very easy to access. Mm. What type of boats do you have? Like, do you own them or do you rent them every time as well? So we have three boats of our own, uh, one based in southeast England, one in the southwest and one in east Scotland. And uh, we, <laughs> where, where needed, we also beg, borrow, uh, not quite steal uh, other boats as well. There's usually, uh, you know, people nearby uh, in harbours who are happy to take their boat out and assist us. Um, so we, 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 we can use the uh, you know the, the the lovely nature of human beings to assist us with some rescues as well. Sometimes also the R and I, of course, to will call them, and they're usually happy to assist if we've not got anything else happening. Nice. Um, just, oh yeah, the beluga whale situation in France. What do you think about it? Like, was it a good decision? So uh, yeah, there was some. Um, there was this beluga in the River Seine in France recently, uh, which we were asked to advise on. Uh, the animal was in poor nutritional condition, unfortunately. Um, and we ourselves don't have a great deal of experience with belugas either, although we did have one that turned up in the Thames estuary in 2017 for four months. But that was a healthy animal that was feeding itself, doing quite well, and really just required monitoring until it left of its own accord. And that's exactly what it did. We didn't need to intervene beyond that. Uh, we also put the people involved in the French beluga in touch with colleagues in Canada who have dealt with these animals a lot and they provided lots of advice to them. Uh, generally along the same line as ours is that, that you know, the prognosis for this animal would be quite poor. Um, so we would lean towards, uh, you know, the animal needing to be put to sleep. But of course, in this case, they went ahead with trying to relocate it to uh, a facility where they could attempt to rehabilitate it. But then as it turned out, within a few hours, the animal passed away of its own accord anyway, um, which kind of, you know, is the way that we expected things to go despite their best efforts. Um, is there anything? Was there any chance of it surviving, do you think, like if we would have done anything else, any possibilities? No, th I think given the time frame, it died within a few hours of it being taken out of the river. And it wouldn't have lasted long if it had been left in the river as well. So uh, so really, that that's where our recommendation of relieving the suffering sooner rather than later would have come into effect, really, following our protocols that we use. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think anything anyone would have done would have made the outcome any different than it was. Mm -hmm. How long was it in the Sen? I believe it was there uh, for about a week. Oh wow. <laughs> Did it manage to feed at all during that time or was it just starving? <laughs> No, it came into the river already in a poor state of health. So this would have taken weeks, potentially months for it to decline so much to be, you know, practically at death's door, disoriented up a river while outside its normal habitat in this case as well. Um, so yeah, the, the, the chance of recovery, particularly in the river was almost non-existent really, to be honest. Yeah, makes sense. Sad though. Um, on a brighter note, I saw that you set up a seal pup hospital last year. Um, is it paying off? Was it worth it? Yeah, absolutely. We've uh, we've had a seal holding facility, temporary holding facility in Cornwall for the last 10 years. Uh, as we started to get busier due to storm activity um, and getting a lot more casualties in short spaces of time, um, the local rehabilitation centres were getting filled up and run out of space and we were still having seals wash up that needed help. So that's how we started in the temporary holding um, uh, of the of the seals until the space became available to move them on for full rehabilitation. Um, as things got busier and busier um, and the storms really didn't slow down or anything or in fact they increased, uh, we were getting more casualties so it was time for us to upgrade and we built ourselves the our first fully functioning uh, seal hospital where we could carry out the first sort of two to three weeks of rehabilitation for these pups and then 
again move them on to our colleagues at the rehab centers to complete that process for them uh, so this has worked really really well for us you know it's taken 10 years worth of build up uh, mind it's been a really long process to get to where we are now we've got a really good trained team of volunteers around 60 of them who are involved in looking after the animals on a day-to-day -day basis uh, plus myself and our vet who work for the charity who are managing the facility and the animals that are in our care as well and we've been through our first winter and we had 75 pups come through our care and at the moment being August and grey seal season is uh, knocking on the door we're just setting up ready for the next season now. Yeah <laughs> sounds really nice. Uh, how long do seal pups usually stay with you? Is it a few weeks or it can be up to around about three weeks and then by, by then they should really be moving on to the rehabilitation centres. Uh, usually it's actually more like a few days, in fact, and then one of the centres should have a space free for us at that point. Um, but, uh, you know, there are, there are times when we can be having up to 12, if not more, seals in our care at the same time, so it can be a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, do they usually like need to move around a lot or do they just stay where they are? Um, in in rehabilitation, they, they will be in pens for the first couple of weeks at least, uh, while they recover from the issues that they had. Uh, one of the things that they do take time over is putting on enough weight so that they're actually big enough to survive in an outdoor pool again, because they have no blubber layer and they got hypothermic in cold weather, especially overnight. Uh, but as soon as they are bigger and they are healthier off their medications, uh, they can go into outdoor pools then. So that's the one thing that we don't currently have at our hospital. And that's when they can move on to the other rehab centres that do have those. And they pretty much at that point just need to fatten up for a few more weeks until they get released back out to the wild again. So how long do they stay in the rehabilitation centres? Uh, on average, about three months for most deals. Um, it depends on how poorly they were when they first came in and how much weight they need to put on to get to the sort of the target release weight of around 30 kilos for grey seals, uh, slightly less for common seals. But how quickly can they put on the weight? It uh, depends on the individual really. Uh, some are extremely competitive and they do really, really well and steal the other seals as fish. But that's part of the rehab process is learning how to compete against each other for food, just like they would do out in the wild. So um, yeah, so, some animals are much more successful than others at this, but generally, as I say, the, the, the average rehab time is about three months, if not a bit less than that these days as protocols change and shorten the rehab time for them and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, do you often get whale call out? Occasionally, yes. Uh, we get a handful per year of whales. Uh, we're tending to deal more with dolphins. You know, we might get, uh, you know, good um, two, three dozen dolphin or porpoise strandings per year. Whales, is not not so often. And it, as I said earlier, it varies a lot from year to year as well. Mm -hmm. um, just let me check quickly. Getting to the end of my questions. <laughs> oh yeah, you said that like for your volunteers. Are there different positions available or is it all just the same sort of thing? Um, mostly the same sort of thing. The, um, the only other sort of main role that we have uh, for a volunteer is as an area coordinator. So each county has a volunteer area coordinator who will uh, sort of do a lot of the team organisation around running training courses and uh, getting equipment in, doing fundraising events and so on. Uh, and particularly at Cetacean Strandings, taking the lead role as an experienced medic uh, as well. Uh, so that, that's really the only other main role that we have for volunteers in the charity. Mm -hmm. um, um, oh yeah, the whale that you said went up the Thames, was there a reason discovered for why it did that? Uh, that animal, uh, yeah, just out of habitat, disoriented, uh, probably very confused um, and just ended up in the river. We, we do see that from time to time with these debilitated whales and sometimes dolphins as well. Um, they, you know, they're really struggling. They don't maybe quite know where they are all of the time and they come into these rivers, maybe sort of pushed in by the tide sometimes a bit as well. Uh, and as the tide goes out, ended up stranded. Mm -hmm. 
How long was it in the river? Uh, the bottlenose whale in 2006, um, I believe that was around in the river for nearly a week. Well, It'll be about five, five days at the most, I think. Well, um, oh yeah, and how many volunteers do you get? Per, do you have to have it for each call out? It depends on the animal that you're dealing with. Um, you know, two, two, three people can quite happily deal with a seal. Um, if it's a stranded dog, then you might want sort of a good dozen people there. Um, if it's a large whale or, or even a mass stranding, you know, some of the mass strandings that we've had involve dozens of animals and then it, it pretty much is a all hands on deck. And you might be calling people from two, three hours away to come to incidents like that. Do you often get mass strandings? Not often, no. Uh, maybe two or three a year. Um, sometimes with dolphin species, but more often with pilot whales, which usually seem to we seem to be getting like maybe one uh, pilot whale stranding a year on average in the last few years. It seems sometimes a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Do you know what causes it then? Uh, similar things to the single strandings, really. Uh, but in those cases, when there's a lot of animals following an injured or ill animal, they will also come ashore in a bid to help that animal or they just won't leave it and end up stranded as well. So in those cases, a lot of the animals are actually gonna be in healthy condition and suitable for refloating. Mm -hmm. That's good, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, how, like, how do you get the equipment transported to each place or is there an equipment center or what does it work? Most areas have a equipment trailer which can be towed to the stranding site um, or otherwise, um, you, you, you know, uh, it can, if people aren't able to tow the trailer there, they can take the equipment that's stored on it in their car instead and take it to the scene themselves. Mm -hmm. um, um, is there? Oh yeah. Last question. Is there anything to do when uh, when approaching seals? Like, is there anything you should avoid bearing or doing, except for being quiet? Uh, whenever we're uh, dealing with animals, we'll always be wearing personal protective equipment. So, uh, while he is waterproofs, gloves, um, if we're going anywhere near the water, we're going to be in wetsuits, dry suits, life jackets for refloating cetaceans, for example. Um, so, and that's all, of course, detailed in the marine mammal medic course and our risk assessments as well. Mm -hmm. Is there anything they dislike, like to see? Um, not particularly, no. <laughs> not, that, not that I can think of. I mean, generally when we're working around them, we try to be calm and quiet. They're not particularly fond of sudden loud noises or anything like that. Um, they can react yeah. to that kind of thing, I guess. Um, that's about it, really. <laughs> that's good, then. Not too much specificity. <laughs> specificity. <laughs> Well, then I guess that's it. We reached the end. Okay. Uh, Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, for taking the time to join us. It was really interesting and inspiring to learn about BDMLR and what you are doing to help save marine life. And most importantly, what we can all do to help. I hope that some of you watching will learn from this video how many marine animals are injured because of us and that we all have to be more responsible in our day-to-day -day actions and especially when in and around waterways. So thank you all for watching and lastly I hope that some of you divers and everyone else will decide to help and join BDMLR and help save our marine life. And remember to stay responsible guys and see you all next time. Bye!